So it feels like the presentation by Tim is like a transparency on top of this presentation because there's several points where there were things you were saying and I thought, yeah, that's exactly, that fits exactly with what we were learning through, through this process. Um, and uh, Tim said the language is evolving, so it's evolved between his presentation and this presentation while you were taking a little break. <laughs> so I think the language is in flux, and I find no matter, it depends on what you're reading or who you're speaking with, which initial comes first. But I think that's actually not a bad thing, because I think it helps to uh, move us away from labels by the language being something that we have to stop and think about what does the actual term mean. So um, we've used a slightly different um, the LGBTQ2S, but similar with the similar inclusion. inclusion. Um, so I think Robert outlined the intent, the purpose of um, undertaking this piece of work um, with the, the people who got together and, and wanted to learn about, within this community, what would people say about housing preferences, housing needs, um, concerns, um, and that the idea would be to talk to people who are moving toward their senior years as well as people who are already in their, in their senior years. And the hope was to be able to, to shape the future, not necessarily just be on the receiving end of what the future would look like, but to be able to shape it. And, um, and a the project was initially called um, um, Into the Closet again because the, a concern that people would have to uh, move back into the closet if they found that they could no longer live independently and needed to live in some kind of congregate facility. So um, our work included three components. One is the survey, and for the survey we used something called a uh, fluid survey, it was like survey monkey, um, same idea, and we decided to start at age 55. Um, and we used the snowball sampling approach, so people just kept passing the link on to others. Um, it included 11 content questions and nine demographic questions. Um, there was also recognizing that not everybody uses computers. The, um, committee members could just print off a hard copy and make that available to people and that information could be entered. Um, then we did two focus groups and that kind of evolved from our original plan um, to what we did was we ended up doing focus groups with key informants, people who could speak about their own experience but people who were well connected with a network. Um, and just to accommodate time we did two of those and they were mixed, mixed groups and then interviews. And the interviews ended up really just being the beginning of a process of one-on-one -on -one conversation. So there were two conversations and those conversations um, ended up focusing in particular on people who are street involved, and I'll <coughs> talk about that a little bit later. So I'm going to talk about the qualitative part and Tammy the quantitative, and then I'll come back and talk about the implications coming out of the, the work. Um, so the qualitative learning um, sorts itself into three, three areas of learning. So one is what kinds of housing arrangements would people prefer if they could no longer live independently? what factors contribute to people's preferences, and what qualities are important in whatever um, that housing, that shelter arrangement would be. Um, people generally talk about wanting to live in their own homes with support, um, and that would be people's first, first choice. Stay in your own home, bring the supports in. Sometimes people talked in terms of some version of co-housing, and we, I think people have different interpretations of what that means, but something home-like, but maybe not able to stay in my own home for one reason or another, but something that still feels like a home-like home setting. Um, and wherever I'm living, that it would be inclusive. And then when we went a little further in the discussions, um, people had some different views. <laughs> I don't know if you can see it. That's a fork in the road. There was a fork in the road at this point. That's a fork on a road. I, and uh, some, people, some people were talking about um, envisaging themselves in a mixed environment and other people in something that was more, was primarily LGBTQ2S. Um, I'm not going to read each of the quotes. I'm going to speak to some of the quotes and a couple, along, a few along the way I'm going to read out. Um, 
Can you read the, the print at, at the back that's on the quote? Yes, thumbs up. Okay. Um, so for those people who are looking for a mixed setting, there was a sense of not wanting to be ghettoized and not assuming that what unites people is necessarily their sexual orientation or gender identity. But for some people, people are looking to find other people who share common interests rather than saying, I specifically want to live in a community where what creates the bond between us is around our identity. For those people who are looking at something that is more, that is primarily um, an LGBTQS community, um, some people imagine that uh, maybe it would be a building or a floor in a building where people could be living in proximity and could purchase or acquire some services together. In Edmonton, we have art space for people with disabilities, and that's kind of one of the images that came to my mind is a place where, um, um, where people can, in a more economical way, access the supports that they need. Other people went further than that along the same, so I think, same principle, but something um, they just went beyond that to start to think about an intentional um, facility that would welcome seniors who are straight, um, and it would include a gay center in the same building, and that it would be situated in Oliver. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, it should be on Jasper Avenue, or it's not worth doing. <laughs> um, so it needs to be a welcome community. You don't need to have a gay badge. It would be open to other people. It welcomes everybody. It doesn't necessarily have to be about sexual orientation. It needs to be about community. Um, and then some sense of this is possible, that we have the talent, we have access to, to resources, um, that there's a potential that people could be bringing food to one another, that people are creating a sense of community, and that that actually saves money and that's an investment in the future. Um, and that it's getting more and more expensive downtown, the land, uh, the land is getting more expensive, so important to move fast, not to, not to, to uh, dawdle on this, and then the doability is greater than some people think. Across the spectrum, people talked about um, no matter what they were um, imagining as the kind of setting that they would want to live in, people wanted a place where they could age in place, that there would be different levels, levels of care um, if their health deteriorated, and that Recognizing that partners may be at different ages and stages of health, different ages and different stages of health, that 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 setting could accommodate both partners, and um, that could be in the same facility or in a campus of facilities. And some people said they prefer not to live in a place that's exclusively for seniors, but that had um, either in the same building or nearby people of other ages. Um, so the second area is factors that seem to be influencing or contributing to the preferences that people have. So a big one is around the experience people have with being out. Um, the experience with this as your primary community, health status, whether you're single or with a partner and at similar or different ages and stages, and affordability. So there was just a few quotes here that I thought were compelling um, that in terms of being out, that for some people, if they've already been out, then maybe they have a concern about having to go back into the closet, and other people, that's not as big a concern. But for those people who have not been, been out, there, for many of the reasons that Tim talked about, um, then there's a lot more trepidation about what that looks like when you're in a setting where you don't have as, many control, as much control over, over choices. So um, there was a poignant statement here, if I come out to the family, I risk giving up the ability to hold my grandchildren. Um, and then um, a contribution around um, being out in a, in a reserve. On my reserve, I still have one foot in the closet. I don't go out and tell people I'm gay. And then discrimination hinders coming out, and coming out hinders discrimination. And that's true of any kind of discrimination. Past experiences of older people create difficulty. So I think, Tim, you were very clear about that in terms of what people's experience was in earlier years and how that influences where they are now. And there are a number of closets people can be in, and you made that reference at the end that, that there are different forms of discrimination. Some of the times it's layered within 
the same person. But I thought the statement of um, other minorities also feel unsafe when surrounded by a majority that is ignorant, always wondering which minefield will blow up. Um, a whole set of other issues for the trans community. Many are either in the closet or homeless. An example of one person who went through 16 different doc doctors before he could find a good one. Um, a fear of being out in housing won't happen to the generation after us. It would have been unthinkable 10 to 15 years ago. Um, <coughs> Tim talked about um, always coming out, and this was a comment that was very much in line with that. Um, it's a chilling effect as an out gay man I would have, that I would have to go back into the closet or come out again. The interesting thing about us is you never stop coming out. In a facility today, you're up against staff and other residents. So that's the, those were the factors. Um, I, I didn't go into quotes around the other ones that were pretty self-explanatory around the, the other, other factors that contribute. Important qualities, um, ready access to amenities. People talked about the kinds of things that were important around them, and that comes out in the, in the survey as well. Um, having a voice in decision making. Um, respect in terms of attitudes. We want housing options that are safe, inclusive, where people are not vulnerable and do not have to go back in the closet. I, want to, I do not want to live a life of deceit, denial, obligation or risk if I live in this type of community. I want to be free, it has to be a happy zone. And then respect in terms of knowledge and the assumptions that people would make who are service providers. Leaders set the tone for openness, inclusion and respect. We have to recognize there will always be bullying of both kids and seniors. So the last area is around people who are street involved. And I think one of the things that struck me in these two conversations is that uh, um, what people were describing is a very different context. A context, one being that people may not make it into their older years, that people are, die maybe 30 years younger than others um, who have more stable accommodations, stable lives. And, um, and the fact that generally people in mainstream facilities don't want the people with whom we work. With seniors housing, you're more likely to face being ostracized because of being aboriginal than being gay. People are not welcome in any housing because of the way people smell, look, act. They'll shut down access before any other considerations such as sexual orientation come up. In terms of experience with sexual orientation and sexual identity, People are cloaking themselves to stay safe on the streets or in shelters. You do everything you can to minimize your vulnerability when you're living on the street. You have to do this in a shelter. People are looking for your vulnerabilities. If you've been on the street, you likely wouldn't have had a chance to have a steady relationship, to experience a long-term loving relationship where you had some private space. Gay adults, um, the comment was made that gay adults are often struggling with their sexuality. So for people who experience sexual abuse as children, and maybe that came from, um, uh, uh, from a man toward a male child, um, that, that that creates, that, that then somebody starts to feel like, well, was I gay if I had that experience, if I had some arousal, does that mean that I, that now I'm gay as an, as an adult, um, and to make some distinction if somebody indicates to you that they're, that, that they're gay, does that trigger for you a sense that this person might have been a pedophile or might be a pedophile? So it, it just becomes a trigger because of what had happened for people in earlier years. And then for people who are talking about encountering people who are gay, what, what the service providers were saying is that, that they're encountering a lot of bias, a lot of um, uh, stigma, and therefore it's not a safe place, safe space for people of that generation to express their sexual identity or gender identity. In terms of practice, the best practice, um, what people expressed was we don't ask people how they identify their sexual orientation and a sense that to ask that could be to ask the wrong question. So it's kind of interesting when you were talking about the intake, intake form, how people interpret asking that, whether people would trust, feel trust, 
that they have trust in the person who's asking that question, so it opens up some, some challenging questions there. Um, but in one of the organizations, people talked about accessing some training that was being offered ar around this topic area and, um, and feeling that there's a, an openness in their staff to have this conversation um, and that they feel that it's, a lot of it still centers around building a relationship. So, okay, we're gonna move over to Tammy. Thank you, and I'll be back. Thank you, Anne. I'm going to talk a little bit about the survey, which uh, confirms a lot of what Anne has already talked about with the focus groups and interviews. And we think that's particularly important when we're finding the different uh, sources and methods of data are pointing to the same conclusions. That really strengthens um, the findings that, that we are presenting today. So a little bit about who participated in the survey. As Anne mentioned, there were 128 people who we accessed through what's called a snowball sample, where we send the link out um, to uh, some of our own contacts and they continue to pass it on and ask others to pass it further. Another way that the survey was promoted was through the media. Michael and Eric uh, did some media blitz with uh, CBC radio and television and there were uh, some other um, media strategies as well. So we tried to get the word out as much as uh, possible. In terms of the people we had, we did have quite a a young, older population, so to speak. Um, the uh, more of them were in the 55 to 64, what we sometimes used to call pre-seniors. So it's a little bit of a younger uh, demographic compared um, to what we were expecting in terms of hoping to get a few more that were over 65 and even over 70. But we did get a third that were over 65, so we, we still got um, a mix. We had a roughly equal gender split. Most identified as lesbian or gay. There were um, a few who said they were trans or, or mixed in terms of gender identity. We got very, very few bisexual or, or two-spirited. So the, the survey certainly did overrepresent represent um, people who identified as um, lesbian or gay. Uh, more than half were partnered and about a third had what we called children who were a source of support to them. So one of the things we talked about with the Pride Seniors Committee is that uh, LGBTQ2S um, seniors may have been uh, experiencing a situation with their children where their children didn't accept who they were. Uh, so we wanted to know if they had biological or stepchildren or adoptive children who were in their lives and a source of support with whom they had good relationships. So that's what we mean by um, supportive children. About a third of our sample lived alone. And most were white, healthy, uh, socially connected and middle to high income. So again, uh, this, these numbers are representative of our specific sample. We can't say that they're representative of all people in this community in Edmonton as a whole, but they, uh, this is a description of who we were able to access um, through our survey. So the top three preferred uh, housing options for people, you can see the different colors on the bars. The uh, darker blue to the left is people's first choice. The gray is second choice, and then the green is third choice. We ask people to, uh, to rank. And uh, similar to what Anne found with uh, the focus group and interview discussions, the vast majority of people had the first choice to stay in their own homes if they were able to with uh, supports. The second uh, uh, row there in terms of the, first, uh, the second most common first choice was to have some kind of co-op or co-housing that was specific to our community. And then the uh, 
third first choice, which was much smaller, was seniors assistant living. But you can see that that was the second and third choice, or third choice of quite a few people. So when you add the first three choices up, it kind of came out third overall. And then after that was co-op and uh, or co-housing with um, non-specific to uh, LBGTQ2S. So that's just a snapshot of how our, our sample saw their preferences for different housing options. Again, uh, we asked some open-ended questions on the survey because we wanted to hear from people in their own words, uh, in addition to just answering uh, structured questions. So this particular uh, quote really, I think, captured what was important to a lot of people in this sample, regardless of their specific housing choice, inclusivity is really critical. So they want um, people who are close friends, who they consider to be like family, uh, and also to provide individual shared space. People want privacy, they want things to be financially affordable and so on. So this, and in a, in a location where uh, there are interesting things to do that are close to amenities and so on. So I really like this particular quote because it captured quite a few things that came out throughout the survey, both in terms of the uh, numerical information as well as some of the open-ended responses that we had. And this is another a similar type of quote, focused on the importance of relationships, the importance of having some degree of um, privacy, intellectual stimulation, friendship, and so on. So this was a pretty big theme in terms of a positive and, and inclusive environment, regardless of what the specific housing arrangement looked like. This was, was common across uh, a lot of them. We also asked what amenities they would like to have close by. So it's one thing to have you know, a housing environment that's friendly and inclusive and respects you for who you are and so on. But if it's in the middle of nowhere uh, and people can't get around, it's not going to be very pleasant for anybody. So we wanted to know what amenities were important to people. And again, we had the top people rank their top three choices. So parks and recreation facilities came out number one and two. So people really want to be able to get out, go to places that are pleasant, go to places where they can do things that are fun, uh, which you know I think all of us want to do, and, and this community is no different. And then after that was uh, shopping, uh, and that you know was around things like grocery stores, a lot of essential types of, of shopping stuff. Um, and then arts and culture was another one. And then you can see further down the list, there were quite a few other amenities that we asked about and um, were the choice of at least some of the people in the sample as, as being important to them. So a good variety there. And again, easy access come out as another kind of broad theme across the open-ended questions that we ask. So uh, the quotes here, I think, you just again reinforce what uh, came out in the uh, top three choices that you just saw. First one from a female um, participant under 65 with a, who's partnered, wanting easy access to arts, culture, uh, grocery stores, medical clinic, and so on. And then the uh, second one, a, a male under 65, not partnered uh, with a living arrangement that didn't really fit a, a, a defined category. Uh, businesses such as restaurants, bars, you know, places to go. So again, you can see some of the variety in the types of quotes that uh, people gave us or open-ended responses, but you can also see a common theme there of easy access to amenities that people would enjoy. This one was really interesting. Um, in terms of what was most important to people in a supported housing environment, most of the, um, we, we had them rate this from not important to very important. And um, you can again see some of the, the colors up there. Uh, the kind of the gray on the right hand side is the very important and then uh, the, the lime green next to that is the quite important. So most people answered in one of those two categories. So these things were important in one way or another to most people. Uh, and a lot of the top ones you can see had to do with partners. So having a partner respected as the main caregiver was huge. Came out as the most important across the sample in terms of being very important to people. Uh, people being allowed to share their space, the room or their suite with their partner. 
um, partnership status respect it, whether they're partnered or single. So not being judged, for example, if you don't have a partner. Um, people respecting partners showing affection to each other. So four out of the top five had to do with partner relationships, and then the other one had to do with discrimination more broadly. And um, so it seems to be a real concern that when people go into housing, they want to be able to be publicly out with another person. It's not just about being out themselves, it's about having their relationship be out and be respected and be considered valid and equal to everybody else's. So that was, a, I think, a hugely um, important finding we, we got from the survey. And again, there are some quotes uh, that pick up a few of the issues in, in the, um, the numbers that I just showed you. So uh, policies around non-discrimination and that go to diversity as a whole. So as Tim was talking about earlier, our community is diverse within it. So we need to recognize that as well as recognizing the um, LGBTQ2S aspect. Uh, respectful of social and political beliefs and ideals. So people feel like they can you know, have opinions and different opinions are going to be respected. Some of the top concerns and there were some other quotes here that we, we didn't show just for space, but there were quite a few around people just saying, I want to be able to live openly with my partner and kind of general things like that. Um, in terms of uh, asking people for their top concerns, we asked an open-ended question about that and then we themed those. So some of the common themes that came out from the top one for 41% was that they're respected as LGBTQ, and there should be a 2S on there as well. Um, which meant things like cared for, included, accepted. Uh, the quality of the facilities. So like the general population, uh, the quality of the food, uh, the staff and, and how they interact with people, the appearance of the place. Another one that came out with a few people was whether they can have pets there or not. And it was interesting with uh, some of the other category under living arrangements, I had a couple of them that said live alone with my dog or you know, <laughs> things like that. So, so having pets was important to some people. That came out for a third of the sample. And then the overall climate of the environment. So just in general, how people are treated, um, that they're respected by staff, not specific to LGBTQ, but just in general. So general climate came out as well. And then again, respect for partner, was mentioned under open-ended comments as well. Didn't, uh, wasn't mentioned as often here under this three top concern question because some people had mentioned it earlier. So just because it's 23.8% and looks like it's um, fourth here, uh, certainly doesn't, I, I don't want to downplay it because people kind of mentioned it throughout the survey. So not everybody mentioned it again here. Um, Provision of care related issues, so health focus. People want to know that when they're in uh, seniors housing, they're going to have access to health care, especially as they get older. We had a few comments about, you know, I want to know that as I age, that the care will, will adjust to what it is that I need. Affordability came out for a little over a fifth of the sample. So the cost and the feasibility within um, one's resources. And then, as we mentioned earlier, being close to different uh, kinds of amenities was mentioned in that final question on top concerns as well. So again, some of the uh, in their own words. This one, first one was interesting, people having to decide, and this is, uh, I think goes to what Tim said earlier, having to decide whether to come out or not, will it make it easier or harder to make friends? So it, it almost is like going back to school, you know, if I, <laughs> if I myself, will people like me? And I had a casual conversation with somebody two or three days ago um, who said that, uh, actually yesterday, who said that they knew somebody who had gone into a senior's facility who was in their 70s and the person said this is worse than high school in terms of bullying and, and so on. So I think this first quote is really important in terms of are people comfortable being who they are once they get there in terms of making new friendships when they go live in a new place. Uh, respecting family of choice, again going back to what Tim said a while ago. And then being able to remain close friends and partners with people who are much younger 
who may not be in the facility, for example. Atmo oh, second quote around overall atmospheric acceptance. Uh, being able to live with a partner again came up here too. Companionship, life stimulation, uh, kind of freedom and dig dignity. So again, comments here are reflective of a diverse range of concerns that have been raised already throughout the survey. Affordability, if we look at the second quote there. And then being independent for as long as possible and having the different levels of care, uh, being safe to be out. So quite a few of these top concerns that people gave us, they weren't necessarily ranking them in order, but people would put down, you know, at least three, sometimes, you know, occasionally four around things that if I move into a place, what are the things that are important to me? So these are some that are representative of the diversity of the comments that, that came out. The importance to people of being out in housing was another question that we asked. And again, uh, the majority of them, if we look at uh, quite important and very important, we have got um, the majority there close to three quarters that are saying it is either quite or very important to, to be out. We have some that it's less important to, and uh, if I look at that against some of the open-ended comments, there were some open-ended comments that said, I, I, I couldn't care less whether people know I'm gay or not. So there were some people to whom that was not so important, but to a fairly strong majority, it was important for them to be able to be out. And then finally, we found some variations among groups of respondents in the survey. And we do have a couple of pages in the report that give some examples of that. So one example I'll, I'll give you now is that um, we found that among males, m when they talked about co-op or uh, co-housing, a greater percentage of males wanted that to be specific to our community. And a greater percentage of the females wanted it to be more inclusive beyond LBGTQS and include uh, straight people as well. And, and, and the most important thing there was to be inclusive for everybody, but basically be gay friendly. Um, we also found some relationships just among some of these demographic char characteristics. So people who are partnered are more likely to be female, uh, age 65 and older, have supportive children, higher household income. So you'll see some of those kinds of um, relationships among the questions that we asked if you look at the, uh, the full survey in the report. Thank you, and I'll pass it back to Anne. So I'm gonna go, go through the implications, and, uh, and then afterward, we'll come back and be a chance for you to ask questions about the, the data. Thank you, Tammy. So the last um, few slides are about the implications. And this is, um, as Michael and I had an exchange about this, the implications are sort of a beginning set of implications. Today gives you a chance, um, we'll have a process after this part of the presentation for some small conversations with two or three people sitting around you. Um, about sort of what, so what does this suggest to you and to, to identify some priorities um, and that will lead into the afternoon discussion. So these were just some implications that, that, are, um, that emerge, uh, but it's not the, the, the end all statement around, around implications. Um, one is that one size does not fit all. <laughs> that housing preferences are as diverse as the people who seek them. And therefore, the people who are involved with planning from a community perspective, from policy makers, planners, need to take into account that there is a range, a range of preferences. Current reality, I think, Tammy was saying that two thirds of the people that we've heard from, whose voices we heard from so far, are, are under 65. So, and relatively healthy at this time. So I think people respond through the lens of where they are now. And if you're looking into the future, it's, there's a lot of unknowns about what, what your health is gonna be like, what your support is going to be like. So it's hypothetical 
thinking about what would, it, what, would, what would I want for myself when I cannot live independently or even in a home-like setting. So I think it's important in terms of thinking about whose voices we have and whose voices we've not had and what perspectives we have so far and what perspectives we need to fill out the picture of what it is that's going to um, work for people. And I'll come to that next in terms of voices heard, whoops, <laughs> voices heard and not heard. So I, I, it struck me again as Tammy was describing concerns, the top concerns, and it came up in the qualitative part that a lot of the things that people name are universal, regardless of sexual orientation, sexual identity. These are things, if you think about quality uh, arrangements for shelter and support, they're, they're universal for people, for all people as they get older. But given the fact that it, a high priority is, is living in environments that are inclusive, regardless of housing type, then that means there needs to be an intentional strategy to make that so, that that's not just a given that that's going to be there, if that's given that that is so important to people. The respondents, in terms of voices that have been heard, respondents were largely well-resourced, white, middle class, in fairly good health, but not exclusively. But we know that the fewer the resources people have coming into their senior years, whether that's income, or social support, or the more compromised their health, the more limited the range of choices there are available to them. And I'm just going through the experience of helping my sister, who's had a lot of mental health issues, and now more physical health issues, find a place to live that has the right combination of supports. And I realize how complicated it is to find all those things that one person needs in one, in one place. And so the more issues there are, um, then the, the harder it is to find options. So being able to go beyond the population of people who would respond to an online survey um, means having some different kinds of strategies. Um, we, we tried to some extent in terms of people being able to print off a hard copy, making some hard copies available. But I think that takes time for that to reach a wider array of people. So it seems that it's going to be important in order to hear the people whose voices are not represented at this stage is to figure out some other kinds of strategies and to have the time available to hear from those other voices. We did not at this point um, pursue conversations with people who are already living in congregate living. Some of the people who responded to the survey um, there were a variety of arrangements that people are in already, but as a deliberate strategy, we didn't um, enter into face-to-face -face conversations with people who are living in congregate settings. But in order for us to find out what that experience is like, that would also take some strategic thinking of how do you do that in a way that's safe for people to have that conversation about what is, what is actually happening for them. And similarly, Tim talked about allies the voices of the people who work in those, in those settings, um, it's important to gauge their level of awareness, their experience so far, and their openness to strengthening their approach. So, in conclusion, um, this assessment offers a first layer of, of understanding. The community is now in a stronger position to be able to delve more, more deeply in order to advance the issue. So, one of those ways is by seeking input from constituencies not yet represented or not represented in a, in a significant um, size, and by building on experience from other jurisdictions that are captured in the annotated bibliography that SAGE in the United States on their website, there's links to all kinds of different reports, and there are some examples in um, Karen Tang's annotated bibliography of models from other parts of the country. There aren't a lot of them, but um, there, are, there is a page with some models that are in other, in other places. Um, and I want to, just before we 
move into some questions. I would like to extend my thanks to Tammy for being an important partner in thinking through the strategy on this, to Karen, who was so generous with her time in, um, in terms of the annotated bibliography that became a bigger, the project that it was the little project that grew of just looking at this, at a file of materials that the committee had passed to us. But we're, we're not pretending that it's an, a, a full academic uh, literature review. It was rather taking the materials that the committee had already gathered and extending that a little bit further. But she did a wonderful job with that. And to say thank you to Michael, and Robert and Eric who gave us um, direction and support all in a volunteer capacity. So, so we had to take into account what resources were available to, to do this. And I want to say a personal thanks to Sherry McKibben who tapped my shoulder in 2013 and asked for some ideas about the budget for this for this funding proposal. And um, we had many lunch conversations about, about this interest that she had in this and so she's been in my mind all the way through this this project so i would just ask you um, just at this point if people have any questions about what we shared with you and then we'll move after into conversations about what does it mean for you a question maybe we could just turn on the lights candace or maybe or somebody maybe we could just turn on the oh actually the switch is right here i can do that Okay. <laughs> Does anyone have a question of any for clarification? Yeah, on anything. Uh, I was just curious. Uh, you mentioned slides. Oh. I can you repeat that. The, there were more men than women who responded that they would prefer some type of segregated housing situation um, where it would be less inclusive of, of, of non uh, LGBTQ identified people. And I was just wondering if your survey went a step further. Um, if there were more men responding, is their preference in fact to be primarily with other gay men? Or are they in fact open to the accordion, as, uh, as Tim used that word? I was just kind of curious, especially when you mentioned the, the situation of Oliver and the yeah. very specific <laughs> location yeah. of <laughs> the gay. I, just, I, I did a lot of door knocking at, at homes that were identified as lesbian in Westmount. So I, it made me curious whether there was uh, a desire to in fact have uh, both genders or whether it was more uh, male oriented. I wasn't sure. So the gay male ghetto and all over here. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I just wondering if that's <laughs> We weren't able to go deeper into the survey. I think that would be something really helpful to follow up. Um, with the survey, we really had to be careful not to make it too long because we wanted people to do it. So we had quite a few conversations among the evaluation uh, advisory or working group that Ann and I worked with, um, Robert, Eric, and Michael, around you know, how many questions are essential and, and, and what can we ask. The um, questions themselves were a mix of questions from other uh, surveys about similar issues in the states as well as some, some thoughts here uh, locally. Um, so we weren't able to dig any deeper in into what people meant by that option, but I think that's an excellent question for further, um, for further follow-up. When people say they want specific to LGBTQS, do they mean all of it or do they, do they mean part of it? So thanks for that. And I can add in that com the spirited conversation about the Oliver model, I think they were picturing maybe there would be kind of clusters, clusters within the same building but it was kind of like, yeah, I would like to live with other gay men, yeah. and the women might want to live with other women. Um, and it was men who were talking about that, That's having that conversation. There was a focus group, yeah. Conversation. <laughs> there was a focus group I missed. Yeah. yeah. In all of them. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, Jared, do you need us to repeat the questions for the purpose of the recording? So do you mind just repeating the question that came there and then we'll have that for the record? Uh, yes, the, the question was when uh, there were more males who expressed a preference for LBGTQ specific housing, was it specific to gay men or was it the whole, uh, the whole rainbow or the whole accordion within the community? And, and we need some, uh, the survey couldn't delve specifically into that, but there were some indications in the focus group that it was a little more specific to gay men.